Hi everyone and welcome to episode 11 of Teach Tech Play. I'm Eleni Karitsis and I'm your co-host. Tonight we've got a great show ahead of us and um, we've got some wonderful presenters who have two who two who have woken up extremely early and one who is just down the road from me which is quite nice. So um, I just want to welcome everyone. Uh, please remember to vote for your favorite presenter. Last month we had an astounding um, amount of votes. We've also started a hashtag um, for those of you who are watching on Twitter. So if you can just use the hashtag TTPlay on Twitter, that way we can answer any questions or any queries that you have throughout the show. Okay. Now, I would also like to congratulate our last month's winner, Mark Anderson, who presented Adobe Tools, um, in particular Slate and Shape. I know that they're two tools that I have been using this previous month, which both myself and my students are absolutely loving. So huge thank you to Mark Anderson and all our presenters from episode 10. Um, I know it was a great show. Now for our presenters tonight, we've got three wonderful presenters and unfortunately Michael, my co-host, will not be joining us tonight. He's been caught up at work. Um, so we might go straight over to you, Sam. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from and what you do? Sure. Thanks, Lani, and thanks for having me on the show. Um, my name's Sam and I'm a technology and change consultant at Simplify Solutions. So my background's in tertiary education and now I work with schools and unis in Victoria and across Australia with um, helping with Google tools as I'm a Google certified teacher and Google education trainer and also other ed tech tools as well. So thanks for having me. No problem, Sam. Pleasure to have you. Now going across the ocean um, all the way over to Paul in America. Do you want to tell us a bit about yourself, Paul? Sure. First of all, thanks for having me on, Eleni. Um, I'm Paul Solars. I'm a fifth grade teacher from Arlington Heights, Illinois. Uh, I've been teaching for 16 years and I just recently published a book called Learn Like a Pirate and it's about, it's basically how I have um, gotten my classroom to lead itself basically. I, I'm, I still play an important role as a facilitator but the kids, um, they definitely take on a lot of the roles and responsibilities in the classroom so uh, at the very end I'll mention something about that as well. Beautiful. Thank you, Paul. And I know your book is on my must-read book list for the holiday reading, and I'm sure a few other teachers may also be adding that to their own list. And our final presenter from Mexico City, who's also woken up at uh, 4.30 in the morning, is um, Juan. And Juan, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Eleni. Very happy to be here also. Um, yes, I'm a Google Certified Teacher and Trainer, um, also an Apple Distinguished Educator. And I work with um, with some local schools here in Mexico City, but I also work the EdTech team, so I get to do some of the global summits, the Google summits um, in different cities. I got a chance to go to Australia um, a few weeks ago, um, and um, I, I just help schools make the, the best out of their technology, as help them assess their needs, and uh, help them integrate technology the best way possible. So very happy to be here. Beautiful, and thank you all of our presenters for joining us tonight. Now I'm just going to share the slide um, on how to vote. So this is the hashtag and to vote is here. So the link today is bit.ly forward slash ttpe 11 vote and make sure you use uppercase for TTP and then all the rest is lowercase. Um, Eleni, do you just want to maybe pop that up again? I don't think we saw it. Oh. Did it? Oh, hang on, I haven't clicked it yet. Sorry. I'm one step ahead of myself. <laughs> there we go. So that is the link to vote. Thanks, Sam. And remember to use the hashtag on Twitter. So let's get started with tonight's show. Sam, you are our first presenter and we've, I'm being generous tonight. Since Michael isn't here, I thought why not and let you all have five minutes instead of four minutes so we can technically use his time up tonight. Um, so Sam, let me know when you are ready and I will start the timer. No worries, I'll just share my screen. And I'll give you a one minute warning as well. Great. All right. I'm good to go. All right, off you go. Excellent. So I'm going to show two tools tonight. Um, both of them are Google tools, and both of them actually bring the world of print into the online space. 
So what's great about this is that there's still so much information out there in books and newspapers and you know hard copy resources sitting in our libraries that often our students don't get a chance to get into because of course the natural thing they do is jump online and, and do some Google searches and find information that way. So the first one I want to show you is Google Books. Um, really easy to find this, just actually Google Google Books and you'll hit with this site. And we're going to leave the box on the left which is researching a topic. So I'm going to look at earthquakes. Now the great thing about books is that what um, Google have been doing is getting books from libraries and actually scanning them in on these massive, massive scanners so that they're actually digitizing hard copy research resources. What I really like about this tool is when you use it right, you can actually get a preview or sometimes the full text of books without actually having to go to the library. So I've done my search for earthquakes and what I'm going to do now, you can see I've got a stack of resources here. I'm going to go up the top to my search tools and over the left here to any view. And what I'm going to do is actually filter results by only those that have got either a preview of the book or the full view. And I'm going to show you why this is important in a minute. So you can see instantly now I've sort of filtered out my results. I'm going to go to the next one as well and I just want to see books because I don't really want to see magazines at this point. So now I've got all of these books I can look at and I'm going to scroll down. I might have a look at this one here, Earthquakes, open it up. And the beautiful thing is I now actually can scroll through and look at a lot of this book. So there's two really good things for this. One is that often you can get plenty of information out of here without even needing to see the full book at all. The other thing is you actually get a chance to see whether the book's going to be useful for you to you before you go to the library and borrow it. So you know, often the kids are reluctant to go in, look up in the indexes, find whether it's got what they need. They can actually preview it here first. What we can do as well, on the left here with this search box, we can actually search within the book. So if I, for example, want to go to fault lines, which should be in an earthquake book, I would hope. There you go. It tells me exactly what page it's on and I can click on it and read it. And I can also see too that it's in some pages that aren't available in the preview, but at least I know that it's books, got the topic in it, and if I want to go and get it from the library, I can. So that is Google Books. Eleni, how am I going for time? You wouldn't mind. You've got two minutes and 20 seconds left. Excellent. Cool. So the second one I want to show you, by foot tabs, is Google Newspapers, or the News um, Archive Search is what it's also called. And again, you can just Google this one and say Google Newspapers and you'll get it. So what this is, is just as before we saw books being scanned in, this is a whole lot of newspapers being digitized. Now there's quite a collection here from all around the world and I'll show you some of them in a minute. Now unfortunately Google are actually no longer adding to these archives, so what you see here is, is what you get basically, but there's still stacks of really useful resources. So we're down here in Melbourne um, and one of the big um, newspapers here in Melbourne is the AH. I'm actually going to click on that one and you'll be able to see that we have got archives back to the 1850s. So you've got newspapers here all the way from the 50s to the 1980s which means that all of a sudden you've got the opportunity for your students to actually see what life was like in a different time. So if you're looking perhaps at a period of war or the Great Depression or something like that, they can delve into these actual articles and get a real feel for what the people of the day were doing. So I could just uh, pick anyone, I'll open up this one from January 2nd, 1960 and I can zoom in, I can read all the articles, I can see how publishing has changed over the time and how writing styles have changed, there's stacks of different things you can do here. One minute. Thank you. The other thing that you can actually do, if I jump back, is there's this keyword search at the top. And I've just done a fatal mistake of actually going back to the Google News site. So let me just jump straight into where I need to go. Now, the keyword search actually never used to work very well, but now it's a lot more powerful. So I'm just really going to quickly do it. So, for instance, if we wanted to type in Chernobyl and search newspapers for articles on Chernobyl, we can do that. And again, once we've got in here, what I actually recommend you do is use your search tools and set results, oops, sorry, from any time and set a custom range. So if we search, for instance, 1986 to 1987, which was the years around that incident, we will actually get newspaper results from that period from the news archives. So you can go straight into um, yeah, the newspapers from that time from all around the world. So you can compare what people in the US are saying, Australia were saying. Um, anywhere, Russia. So that's it, Eleni, done. Perfect timing. Excellent.
Well done, Sam. And I know that actually just reminds me, I always forget about um, Google newspapers and um, Google books and it's just reminded me because we're actually looking at media articles at the moment that display conflict. So that's a perfect thing that I know I'm doing this week that I can just pull up and go and look at and explore with my students. So thank you for that friendly reminder. <laughs> Did any of our other presenters have anything they'd like to say about Sam's um, presentation tonight? I did. Sam did, uh, and you might have said it. I, 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 I was listening. I just don't know if you did. Uh, can we refine the search um, by reading level within that Google newspapers as well? Uh, no, because the reading levels actually disappeared from Google search full stop now. Um, <laughs> and it's, yeah, and it's actually it was, already... It was about uh, a, month, a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? Yeah, was it just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. No, that's great I'm to know. Battery. Shattering for us primary teachers, that's how I like go to. No, I, I think it's it's great. It's a, it's a great tool and I'm just thinking about mixing it with Google Translate and look for newspapers in other languages to see other points of view, the other side of the story, uh, how you could combine those two tools. Yeah, it, it's a great, it, it's a fun tool. Yeah, I Very think so. Just so much information out there in print and the fact that we can get it so accessible here online, it's yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you, Sam. So next up's myself. So I'll just share my screen and get the timer started. So what I'm going to be sharing with you today is I'm going to be talking about coding in the classroom. So we know coding is becoming a big part um, in education and that students need to have the skill of knowing how to code and what it is. So a lot of teachers I find are finding it difficult to know how do they incorporate it, they don't even know what it is themselves, how do we find the time considering we've already got such a busy curriculum to fit it in and you know it's just another time thing and is it really worthwhile. So I'm going to just go through two programs that I found that are really good in just allowing students to explore and play and I know that my year sixes I use both of these as early finishes sometimes if you've got that extra five minutes or just in between lessons giving them five ten minutes to go and explore. So the first one is touchdevelop.com forward slash app and in touchdevelop you come to a website that looks like this. It is powered by Microsoft and when you get to it there are different tutorials. So my students have already completed the first steps tutorial but another great one that they absolutely love is Jumping Bird and I'll go into it and just show you if it wants to load, here we go. So once we get into it, oh, it's, I've already, I was playing with it earlier. So what it does is it allows you to go through and if you're not sure what to do, you click on where it says, what do I do? Tap that line there. And then it tells you the script. So the students have to look in the bottom part and it gives them hints. So at the start, it sort of tells you what to do. So you get the hang of it. And then we go here and I'm simply just clicking. But then the cool thing is your students learn and see what they're actually doing. So here I've got my chicken flying through the farm. So if I then click here, oh, I completed that level. And you sort of keep going and the students actually begin to create their own Flappy Bird. And I know Flappy Bird is something that oh, um, every single student, I think, above the age of five is aware of and they absolutely love. So you can just see here, I keep going, okay, now do it yourself. So this is my goal, I've got to add these things in. So I've got to look, all right, I knew it, no, it's got this. Then I've got to set the acceleration. Um, I think that's on the next page. Um, to Y, yep, and then I've got to enter in the numbers. So I want to move my cursor back and put 400. And, oops, I've done too much now. And then I run my script and my bird's now falling. So the next thing I've got to do is, so when I hit the um, space bar, I can then add the next thing. And it continues on. So your students end up creating their own game and then they can share that with their parents. They end up getting a link and they can email it to themselves. So they've accomplished something that they are familiar with. The other thing I want to share with you is Blocky Games. Now, Blocky Games is a Google... Um, form of coding and it uses the similar coding um, clip in there for the name Blocky um, games that similar programming things such as Scratch and Code.org use. So by going to Puzzle it starts off with a simple 
um, match the bits that, so a duck, we attach the picture and then how many legs, it's got two. So this is simple um, computational thinking that students start to think and add. Once you've completed this, and I should have done this earlier, it goes on to the next one where students have to, um, it's really hard to um, try and work it out and do it at the same time. It's got a shell, it's got a beak, and what they do the next one is they've got to actually uncode it and make their own, it's got whiskers, it's got fur, I'm trying to do this quickly, I'm weary about the time, stinger goes for here and I'll put the B. So it starts off quite basic but then it gets quite um, difficult the further the students go through it. So if I go check answers, beautiful, correct. I then go on to maze and then in the maze I've got different activities and this actually saves it so I want to move forward if I run the program I've moved forward once that's not far enough I need to drag and drop and then I reset and I've made it to the point and then I can go to level two and it gets more complicated and it becomes a bit of a puzzle that the students can work through to develop their coding skills and I have 20 seconds left so these are pretty much the two that I just find a quick, easy that the students can continue to develop their their selves um, in coding. And as you complete different things, you get green markers. And in this one, I, I know my students have been playing this nonstop at home. And you know, it, it only takes them once, and then they get into it, and it it just entices them to do it on their own. So they're just a couple little tools that you know some teachers might find easy to incorporate into their classrooms without having to do too much or know too much of what you're doing and it sort of takes them step by step. Done. Anyone have any questions for me? That looks fun. Um, my students have been doing some coding in class as well this year. Uh, I have fifth graders. Do you think that that's an appropriate grade level for, for the, each of those? Um, yes, I've got six graders and I've been using both of them with mine and um, I know that the touch develop one, I had to think what it was called then, They've, that's what they started their first coding on. We had Microsoft actually come out to our school and run a one hour of code and the kids, my students absolutely loved it and I keep getting little emails from them now that they've completed a different game, a different challenge, and you know there's all there's a little heap out there, and sometimes Scratch is just a bit overwhelming for at the start saying like, what do I actually do? What am I supposed to be doing? And you know, Code.org's great, and there's a Code Academy, and there's thousands out there, but you know sometimes they're all just a bit too much, and you just need a quick little something that is worthwhile that they can go on with themselves, and they're just two that I think are quick and easy and fun to use. Yeah, um, I had a question about touch develop. Are you using it on computers? Do you know if it's uh, if you can it, use it on tablets they, and smartphones? They both work on iPads because I'm one to one iPad. So both blocky games and both um, touch develop work on iPads. Anything, anything with a web browser, you can get it to work. So uh, and I think that's another reason why I've gone with that direction because I know it works on an iPad and I don't have to stress and worry about all the other stuff that happens on iPads. <laughs> Alrighty, we might keep moving and Paul, you're up next and I'm excited to see what you are doing with Weebly Blogs as ePortfolios. So let me know when you'd like me to start the timer. Alright, I'll start screen sharing. Um, I, let's see, start screen share. Um, once you see me, once you see the screen, you can start it if you'd like. Yep, off you go. All right. Great. So I use uh, Weebly with my students, and uh, we use it as an e-portfolio tool. So I have my kids um, each day they they create a blog entry on their own e-portfolios that kind of shows what they learned and what they um, what they did in class. So I wanted to start off with the editor where you, where the kids would actually go in. These would be all my sites. You would click on edit, and then you would go and you'd see uh, the editing tool. So this is our current website for the year. This is uh, a shared website. It's so I edit it and my students edit it, and I give them uh, permission for certain pages. And what what you do is you would just add a new post. They're all blog pages, um, and you can drag and drop everything. It's really simple for students to use. So if they want to drag in a text item, they can drag in a text item, and it loads, and you can start typing and whatever you need to do. 
Um, and then you can post it, and it all goes live. I, you can actually have it um, where you where the teacher can moderate it, but I have my students posting live. Um, and then these are all the pages on our on our current blog or our current website this year. Um, my students have access to some of those pages, so all my kids are editors. Um, they're actually not considered students in in this; they're considered editors, and I give them authorship rights. Um, and then I, I just decide which pages I want to allow them to edit and which pages they don't. So they can only see the pages in their editor that are checked. And every student can have different pages if you'd like. Um, I really wanted to take you through some examples of what we do on our ePortfolios more than how to use it. Uh, so you can see like why we use it and, and the things that Weebly is able to do. Um, so we start off kind of simply. Uh, you know, this was an art appreciation activity by some parents that came in. Um, and we learned about Andy Warhol and we made our own Andy Warhols but what I do is I have the kids do a little research ahead of time so that they know what's going on and maybe we even just copy and paste and give credit or we paraphrase what we learn and we put it into our blog entry and then the kids will remember what we did that day um, in class. Here you know we're on an Oregon Trail uh, simulation in class uh, we're learning about how the US expanded westward and uh, we're pretending to visit different sites. So I had my kids all take pictures in front of the green screen, and I just put them into different photos. Um, and then as we learned about each location, my kids uh, either created a fake story or reflected on what we learned in class, and we uploaded those photos. Um, here we're learning about science, uh, different kind of resources, natural resources versus man-made. I, I had them drag in some images that they found on a Google search. Um, and all of these are linked. Uh, if you click on it, they go to the site that uh, we got the image from so that they're giving credit. Um, then there's some questions at the bottom that asks the kids to reflect on what they learned, some specific things that I can check for understanding. So it's almost like an exit slip. Uh, and then if we go on, um, here we, we did a program called Money Island where I teach my kids about financial literacy. Um, and the kids kind of run through, uh, they, they do this experience where they, they have to save money, they have to spend money, they have to pay bills. Um, I, when my kids achieved at different levels, I had them take screenshots and then post it. And if you click on it, it's supposed to expand larger so you can read what it says so that you can see everything that they earned. Um, and then they answered some questions. This one actually included a, a, a persuasive letter, an argumentative essay, um, telling people that they must include Money Island in their, in their curriculum. Um, here we learned about tessellations and what is a tessellation and what is not a tessellation and it's in a slideshow and it's just going back and forth but this is a tessellation because it can it can uh, move apart left right up and down this is not a tessellation because when you move it together it has gaps and overlaps and I, my kids were able to show me those things through their e-portfolio instead of having to um, interview them each individually or, or check on their check on them individually here we're on a field trip I had my kids bring our iPads, we took some photos, um, they had to take a couple notes between partnerships, so they took turns taking pictures, taking a few notes. We were learning about what life was like back in the 1780s. Um, One so minute. Th thank you. Uh, and cut me off when I go over my minute, please. <laughs> um, and so they, they put their photos into a slideshow. Um, and uh, and continue from there. So let's see this one. We start doing videos in our class an awful lot. So here we wrote a story, um, and I had my kids actually read the story out loud so you could hear their voice and how the characters react in situations. Um, here we're doing energy transfers, how energy goes from one thing to another. So here it's going through electrical. It's going to create light through the light bulb. And then I had my kids answer some questions that support that. Um, here we made an elbow joint to show how ligaments and tendons and bones work together. Um, so here we did a science fair, so we did a video before the science fair and a video after the science fair to show how we improved through practice, and we uh, reflected on that. Here's another field trip with videos. We were newscasters uh, at a museum. Um, over here we talked. We do passion time, so uh, my kids create a project that they're interested in and post it, and I send it off on Twitter and have people around the world comment, giving feedback and giving information. And here my kids all respond back and forth to that information as well. I think I'm out of time, but thank you very much. <laughs> no problem, Paul. That was wonderful. You've given me some ideas now of things that I can get my students to do. So that was wonderful. Thank you. And it looks like your kids have been very busy. <laughs> Pretty sure we are. Anybody have any questions about Weebly? I do. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, Sam. Sorry, Michelle. Um, I just wondered, in terms of ease of use compared to something like Blogger, Weebly is easier, is it, particularly for the younger kids? Or 
You know, it's hard for me to compare because I actually haven't used Blogger with the kids. Um, what I know is kids are able to do both very easily. Weebly um, is extremely user-friendly, and it's got kind of an interface that the kids really enjoy looking at and using, and the drag-and-drop makes it simple. Um, I have a tendency to explain it once, and the kids are able to teach each other the rest of the time, so it is pretty user-friendly. Our whole K-5 through school is actually using it. Um, as well. I, everybody uses it at a different level, but um, everyone is using it in our building. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I had a question about, uh, I think I saw that uh, you have pro accounts, right? Because I've seen oh, people yeah. use the, the free version. Uh, what does that give you? It seems like you can manage them and oversee them better. Yeah, so the way I use my Weebly, um, I don't take advantage of all the pro features because I don't actually add my students as students. Um, I add them as editors, uh, which you can do in the free version as well. Um, what it allows them to do is they can create many more websites themselves. They can already create three, I believe, with the, with the free version. I think they can create more on their own. Um, you can drag in some audio and have it stored on Weebly's server instead of, like, uh, you know, on something in the cloud. Um, you can have a scrolling header. You might have seen my pictures, my class photos going across. I don't know if I, I brought it down, but headers and footers. There's some unique things, but uh, mostly what I showed you was all part of the, the free version, pretty much. Very cool. Well, yeah, that is really cool. I haven't used Weebly. I've used Blogger, and I've used a different one that we have in Melbourne, uh, well, Victoria, called Global 2 Blogs, which is similar to Edu Blogs. Um, uh, but yeah, that one looks really great. I might have to even explore that one next year. Um, so thank you for presenting on that. I know that it would be very handy for a lot of people trying to decide which platform to go for and the way it all works. So thank you. And next we've got Juan to finish us off for tonight's show. Thank you. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Off you go. Great. Let me put my timer to Okay. Um, so Eleni, you you did you talked about Google Views last time last month. Um, so I thought, why not um, try to take it to the next level? And, and I tried a few things to see what you could do with Photospheres, and um, I had a lot of fun. So maybe you, uh, I can convince you guys to to try it out too. So Photospheres are these 360 uh, photographs that you that uh, you can take with your own phone. It works with Android and with iOS. Um, you can upload them to Google Maps or to Google Views. So uh, besides looking at some really, really cool ones, you can take your own. Um, and all it takes is a smartphone or, or a tablet and um, just trying to keep steady and, and you can create some amazing pictures. Um, so what I want to do now is try to play and edit these, these 360 photos because it's easy to edit a, a photo, <laughs> just a, a regular um, flat photograph. And uh, I went to a community, a Google Plus community, where people share photospheres. And I found this very cool uh, sculpture in Barcelona, Spain. So um, I'm going to try to edit this. And um, you, you can actually download these and then uh, edit them online. I'm going to use Pixlr. So um, you'll see that I'm in 360 view. I can look around. And then there's this button to make this photograph flat. And I need to download this version to make uh, the, the flat version so I can edit it. I'm going to add some text and, and some pictures. Let me zoom out so that I get the, if you zoom out all the way, you, you get a better quality photograph. So I'm going to save the image. Um, save as whatever, it doesn't matter the name. Okay, now I'm going to open it in Pixlr. I'm going to have to go a little bit faster now. There you go. Um, and in Pixlr, Pixlr is, is free, so I can use Pixlr Express or, or Pro. I'm going to add some, let's see, some words here. Let's say, um, um, a giant lobster. And I can't see it. Okay. That didn't work. Let me try again. 
Okay. Giant lobster. <laughs> um, apply. Then I'm going to add some other stuff. Let's see, some stickers. Um, maybe a frog somewhere. Let me get a little smaller here. Okay. I'm just going to add a couple things. But the thing is, you can add and annotate um, things on, on your image. I'm going to save it. Um, I'm going to do it full quality just so that it looks nicer. And save it. And now your, your 360s, I'm going to replace it. Your 360s, um, you can upload to Google Plus. Before it recognizes as a photosphere, it needs some tags, some uh, location tags. So there's a, a page where you can upload them, and I'm going to put it on the show notes. It's a photosphereappspot.com, and um, what you do is you upload the picture and add the location One information. Minute. Yep. Oh, this is going to be tight. I'll make it, I'll make it. Okay, a hundred percent. And then I'm going to look ooh, where in the world that picture is and that didn't, huh. Okay, let me try it again. Of course, I tried it like 10 times and it worked. Okay, it's uploading again. So uh, you upload it here. You you on a map. You say where um, you look for it, and then you can upload your pictures here in Google Plus Photos and make them photospheres. So I'm gonna have to use one that I already uh, have, and you can look around and you'll notice that I added a, a QR code here and some annotations here, so you can actually edit your 360 pictures, and I guess I'm out of time. Yes, you are. But that is fantastic, and it always happens when you're presenting that it doesn't want to actually work, so I'll let you finish off just showing people where it goes, because I'm okay. interested, actually. I want to know what happens. Okay, um, so I'm, <laughs> sorry guys, I'm downloading it now. I think it's just my internet being slow. And I'll upload it here. And I did some tests, and I could do it in four minutes. But of course, I wasn't explaining. I was just doing it. So now I'm uploading it in, in uh, Google Plus Photos. It recognizes that it's a 360 picture because of the tags and because of the uh, of the way the photo is. It's okay. There it is. I won't share it on Google Plus right now. And then we'll be able to view it in, in 360. So I thought it, this would be fun. Like, there's the, there's the frog. <laughs> and let me see. Whoa, giant lobster up there. So I, I thought you could do some fun stuff like uh, scavenger hunt or have kids annotate pictures of, of, of places around the world. So that's it. Wonderful. Thank you for that. That's a great idea. And I know um, my brain's just ticking over now with ways that I can incorporate it into the classroom and into our um, units of inquiry, especially to get them thinking further beyond the classroom into world perspectives, which is absolutely great. So thank you for that. Any of our other presenters have anything they'd like to say? I can totally see using that in a lot of different ways, especially, uh, you know, we're mystery Skyping with other classrooms around the world. We could possibly go into Street View and check out where they're at, and maybe we can annotate some of the area around us, you know, and help them see things around us. I, a lot of ideas spinning. Cool, cool presentation one. Thanks. Yeah. And it was really good to see the um, image editing tool you were using there as well, combining that into it, so that was really useful. Yeah, um, and I used Pixlr right now. I have used GIMP, so GIMP works. I've used it in Linux, but I know it works with PCs and Macs. Uh, and there, it retains all of the location information, so I didn't have to upload it uh, again to this to this page, the Photosphere Maps location uh, thing. Uh, so, so if you have GIMP, 
you can skip you can skip that process. But uh, yeah, I, I like this one because it's online, so I'm doing it on a Chromebook. Wonderful, thank you. And it's always good to know what our presenters are on. I haven't um, had a Hangout yet on a Chromebook, so I just use my Mac all the time. But yeah, it's good to know what other devices people are using. And I think that's the thing today. There's such a range of devices. It doesn't matter what you are. You can always make different things work. If one program doesn't work, I'm sure something else will. So it's always good. So it actually comes to the end of tonight's show. So I'm just going to share the link before our presenters just share one more thing um, that is going on in their own lives. So um, please make sure you vote for your favorite presenter. The link again is bit.ly forward slash capital TTP lowercase e 11 vote. Voting is now open and it's open until Friday um, 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. So make sure you vote for your favorite presenter. I know two people have woken up extremely early and we appreciate all our presenters of finding the time to come on. Now, just before we end the show, I know that there are upcoming PDs. I know in the States they're about to head into summer break, but it never ends for teachers. I know they've got a heap going on. So, Paul, do you want to share what's coming up for yourself? Sure. I think uh, something that uh, people, that I would at least enjoy if you guys would do is on Mondays, starting this coming Monday, June 8th, at 7 p.m. Central Time U.S., um, we're doing a learn like a pirate chat, so it's at hashtag learn lap, L-E-A-R-N-L-A-P. Um, we're going to do a book study on, on the book that I just published, Learn Like a Pirate. Uh, we'll break it up into six sections. So that first section is chapters one and two. Um, you don't have to have read the book to join in, um, but you know we'll be talking about the book section by section. So uh, I expect a pretty big crowd. It should be a great discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. And I'm just trying to work out the time difference here in Australia, so hopefully I can join in. <laughs> I don't know if it will work or not, so I have to work it out. I can't do it in my head. Thank you. Um, there was one other thing I was going to mention, Juan, with um, Photospheres. Have you heard of the um, Ricoh Theta camera, which actually takes 360 photos as well? We have yeah, you, you just do it with one click, right? Yeah, Yeah, and it saves all those mini steps and people interfering and getting in the way of your photo, which is always cool. But unfortunately, they're not available yet in Australia. We have to get them sent over through Amazon. But um, I know you in the States, you always have access to great technology first. So that's one thing that is awesome out there for those photo spheres. Sam, did you want to share what you've got coming up? You're muted, Sam. Whoops. Sorry, back now. <laughs> um, I was just going to share the link to my relatively new rebrand of blog, so I'm just actually going to quickly do a screen share. Sorry, I'll be quick. That's all right. There we go. Just so, I won't worry about that. So, yeah, if you want to take a look at my blog, techsmartedu.com.au, I've got a blog post up there about Google Books, actually, and I'll be doing one on newspapers in the next couple of weeks. And you can find me there on Twitter, or Google Plus, or email as well. And that's it for me. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Um, loved having you on the show and appreciate you finding the time. And yeah. um, do you want to share what you've got coming up? Uh, sure. So um, I think I, I mentioned about the EdTech team, Google and Education Summits. So they're all over the world right now. And if you want to go to the site, GAFE Summit or G-A-F-E Summit to see one that's coming uh, near your area. I'm doing three in the States this month. And um, also maybe invite people to join um, another chat. Well, I know you guys have an Aussie chat. There's a Met at chat on Twitter. It's uh, on Mondays at 9 Central. So I, I have no idea what time. It's probably very early in the morning for you. Well, maybe not that early on Tuesdays, but maybe you can join one day, wake up early like like we did, uh, <laughs> and uh, join some some cool educators. And, and it's great just to, to know people around the world, what they're doing, and, and connect. Uh, it's just how you can uh, connect with other schools and do a collaborative projects. So if you want to join Max at chat on Mondays at 9 p.m. Um, Central Mexico. 
Thank you, Juan. And yes, I know there are heaps of chats in America and I always am jealous when I um, can't join. But occasionally, sometimes they do work, especially, well, I can't work out the exact times now, but sometimes they do work, especially we could be teaching, but those teachers who have released can always jump on and get involved. And I just wanted to share some of my upcoming PD that I am running. So this week I am going to be running some online PD. Um, it's a three course a three night course where three Wednesdays this week, week after and the one after that. You can join me where I'll be exploring a whole range of tech tools that you can that can be implemented immediately into the primary classroom. And I'll be covering things that can work on Chromebooks, iPads, um, GAFE schools, pretty much anything. So um, that's the top link. And the second link is um, a two day workshop I am running at in the Australian Capital Territory or also known as ACT and I'll be having a two-day workshop looking at GAFE um, there so check out both of those links um, and hope to see some people joining me for those so that's some exciting stuff that I'm doing and that brings us to the end of the show so I'd like to say a huge thank you to our presenters once again for joining us and also to all our viewers out there just a reminder that our next show is actually a very special one, Teach Tech Play Turns 1, which will be a bit of a celebration, considering I originally I thought this wouldn't last more than two months and we're still going quite strong. So it is quite fun. So our next one is on Monday, July the 6th. And I know it's just after ISTE in America, so hopefully a few people over there are still wanting to spend their summer holidays learning and can join us for Teach Tech Play's first birthday. A huge thank you to everyone. I know that there's some great tools that I'm going to be implementing this week and it just makes me excited every month seeing what is out there, reminding my brain about the awesome things that can happen and getting them going within the classroom. So thank you again to everyone for tuning in to episode 11 and look forward to seeing you all at episode 12. See ya. Thank you.